Now, let's talk about her abilities as a prosecutor and basically her ethics. Uh, <laughs> a lot or of lack thereof. <laughs> yeah. A, a problem with Senator Kamala Harris, especially during her prosecutorial years, is ethics. And that is what a lot is called into a question, uh, into account for a question. If, uh, if many of her detractors on the right took the time to read information and facts and statistics, they would look at the ethical problems of her prosecutorial record and not her sexual history, for instance. But the fact is, is everybody feels like that there, people are not people individually may be stupid, but there is a there's a wisdom of crowds that feels out a person and sort of judges a person's character. And there's a lot about Biden, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris that feel phony, like, you know, like Donald Trump, we all know is a bullshitter. You know, we, we all kind of know what's going on. It's just people make they rationalize. Can I vote for this person? Um, but she's the type of person that has pushed boundaries in an effort to position herself a certain way. And innocent people got hurt when she was a prosecutor. So, for instance, there are over 1000 drug related sentences that were overturned due to her faulty practices. So while her conviction rate was high, her ability to retain those sentences was low due to the false nature of her prosecution. Now, Harris made the first arrest of Backpage CEO. Backpage was, uh, um, excuse me, CEO Carl Ferrer. Backpage was a website that you could go and it basically was connecting sex workers with Johns. And you could screen them out and, uh, you know, it, it was... It was an online tool for prostitution, for instance. Uh, so he now he was not convicted on these arrests or charged on them, but eventually pled guilty to another arrest for similar charges that were filed. Backpage was a site that, quote, according to them, unknowingly offered young prostitutes to buyers on top of illegal substance sales. Harris alleges that 99 percent of these girls were under 18. I have no idea. I have no I've never been to the site. Uh, I have, you know, really one of the first times I've heard of it was doing the research for the show. It seems to me that it strains credulity to say that 99% of the women that were on Backpage were underage, under 18. I mean, I don't know. Uh, so, so she busted them while sex trafficking occurred on the website. And let's be honest, it was a feature of the website. The owners were actually very good about reporting suspicious listings to authorities. So they did cooperate with local law enforcement. And um, our researcher, Hody, added in a link that you can verify all this stuff. Our show notes are up at wearelibertarians.com or in the podcast description on episode 451. Um, but instead of prosecuting the sex traffickers that the, the page owners had reported, Harris and her team's went after the same people who were open with authority. So instead of going after and prosecuting the people that were the back page, people were reporting, they prosecuted back page. They said free activity between two consenting adults cannot take place. We need to get rid of the thing that is keeping sex workers safer than not. Uh, she was instrumental in shutting down the back page site and arresting nonviolent offenders and sex workers. And what this did is it forced many of them back onto the street where they were violated and abused by pimps and home, you know, drug users. I mean, and any number of people, um, as Hody, our researcher says, good prosecutors go after pedophiles, rapists, and traffickers. Harris went after website designers that were explicit about calling out pedophiles, rapists, and traffickers. She actually arrested two of them, even after publicly admitting they were innocent of the charges, and a judge was forced to throw out her bogus charges. Um, she also advocated a law that would force truckers to turn in sex workers. So... I want to go back to this reason video that kind of encapsulates this a little bit more and gives you a better view of it. So let's take a look at this. This is from reason.com. America has a deep and dark history of people using the power of the prosecutor as an instrument of injustice. I knew this history well, of innocent men framed, of prosecutors hiding information that would exonerate defendants. Yes. And during her time as California's top cop, Harris contributed to that history repeatedly. 
by going to bat on behalf of dirty prosecutors. Her office appealed the dismissal of the case in which a prosecutor had fabricated a confession to secure a conviction and fought an appeal in a case where a prosecutor had lied to the jury during trial. In 2015, Harris tried to stop the removal of the Orange County District Attorney's Office from a murder trial after it repeatedly failed to turn over evidence to the defense. Her office even tried to keep a man in jail who had been wrongfully incarcerated for 13 years after a judge ruled that he had proven himself innocent just because the man hadn't delivered that proof quite fast enough. And as San Francisco DA, Harris hid known misconduct by a crime lab technician who admitted to deliberately tainting evidence. Did prosecutors working under you know about the concerns about that lab? The prosecutors, and, which in is my what the judge alleged, did not know about it. At least said they did not know about it. The debacle has since led to the dismissal of hundreds of criminal cases. Something else it's past time we get done is dismantling the failed war on drugs, starting with legalizing marijuana. Your opponent, okay. Ron Gold, has said that he is for the legalization of marijuana recreationally. Your thoughts on that? Um, I that he's entitled to his opinion. <laughs> Harris is a former drug warrior who is now refashioning herself as pro-legalization. That's a positive shift, but not a reason to rewrite the past or ignore the patterns it reveals in her judgment. For years after the cultural tide had turned in favor of criminal justice reforms, Harris continued to support lock -em up policies that disproportionately hurt minorities. As California Attorney General, Harris opposed marijuana legalization as late as 2014, promoted civil asset forfeiture without a conviction as a way to fight drug rings, and sought to more aggressively police prescription drug use. In her 2019 book, The Truths We Hold, An American Journey, Harris reveals that her drug warrior mentality hasn't changed. We also need to reinstate the DEA's authority to go after the major pharmaceutical manufacturers and distributors, and we need to invest resources in law enforcement efforts to cut off the supply of fentanyl from China. Let's believe in a more perfect union without mass incarceration of African-American men. We put more people in prison than any country on earth for no good reason. Yes, we do. And once these people were in prison, Harris saw to it that they'd have a hell of a time getting out. I absolutely believe there should be severe and serious consequence for violent crime, which is why I've prosecuted those cases and will always seek the highest sentence. As a prosecutor in law enforcement, I have a huge stick. So I decided I was going to start prosecuting parents for truancy. Before her recent about face, Harris chose not to endorse proposed sentencing reforms on the California ballot in 2012 and 2014. And she defended the constitutionality of cash bail until 2016. Harris's office also fought an order to reduce California's prison population after the Supreme Court determined the conditions amounted to cruel and unusual punishment. Although she later claimed to be shocked by what they had done, Harris's attorneys argued that nonviolent offenders should stay behind bars because the state needed the cheap labor they provide. We are part of a longer story, and we are responsible for how our chapter gets written. As she tries to convince voters to put her a heartbeat away from the presidency, Kamala Harris is trying to rewrite her last chapter, but her record is yet another reminder of the terrible choice voters face in the 2020 election. I think you can judge people by when they are under fire, and it's not about some fancy opinion on a stage, but when they're in the position to actually make a decision, what do they do? Okay, so <clears throat> lots there. Uh, we'll continue talking about it. Uh, well, that last line is is really a great tag because it's exactly what she's been doing, right? She's yep. saying we, we shouldn't do this, and that's what she's obviously been doing. We should not do what I've been doing for my career since 1990. Uh, <laughs> so uh, she, it was mentioned in there that she went after parents who... Uh, had truant kids, um, you know, put here, here's the thing. Uh, as libertarians, we believe that mandatory schooling should be abolished. Plain and simple. If a kid doesn't want to go to school, they shouldn't be forced to go to school because what that does is that lowers the performance of the other kids sitting in the school. And so a prosecutor who is prosecuting parents for their truant child Let's put our thinking caps on and think about what type of parent has a truant child. It's probably a single parent whose life is somewhat chaotic and they're barely hanging on because they're lower income parents. Typically, your middle class and upper class 
parents send their kids to school. Oftentimes, the parent who has a truant child isn't even aware that their parent, that their kid is truant, that isn't showing up to school. It's a surprise to them. And so she's now making life harder on the very people that she says she supports. So, you know, when she's been confronted with this, she laughs. She laughs about it. And so she has this tendency that keeps getting her in trouble that you will see again through the campaign is that when she's confronted with criticism or her record, she laughs it off. She like <laughs> Trump keeps kind of pointing that laugh out and doesn't like her laugh. The right does too. Um, Hillary Clinton did the same thing. It, it gets her in trouble because it comes across as very insensitive, it, you know, similar to the famous line from Hillary, you know, we came, even we, oh, we died. <laughs> you know, that line that you've heard in every sound clip. So, um, you know, she chose to really crack down on these victimless crimes that ended up making life harder for the, the economically disadvantaged in her community, which is what she said she's against now. Um, she was a major prosecutor of marijuana while using it herself. Um you know, she fought to keep people, if a judge tried to be lenient, she fought to keep people in prison, even after her state adopted policies that let the over-incarcerated go free. She opposed those. She she fought the state in trying to allow these victimless criminals out of jail. Um, she, she also, in 2012, uh, su uh, Superior Court Judge Ann Christine Masulo ruled that San Francisco District Attorney Harris's office violated the defendant's rights by hiding damaging information from po police crime lab technicians, destroying evidence, and ignored demands from lawyers and judges in responding to what happened to missing evidence. In 2015, an appeals court summoned her for review of three of her many cases that result in an innocent person being convicted. In one, she allowed a fake confession to be used in court. In another, she committed perjury by telling a prosecutor to change his story based on evidence he would have known, he wouldn't have known. By repeating this false testimony in court, she perjured herself. In a third case, she gave evidence to a technician that was not obtained from the scene of the crime in order to make a finger, fingerprint connection. Though guilty on all three counts, a federal judge nullified any penalty Harris would have received, but told Harris's lawyers to, quote, talk to the attorney general and make sure she understands the gravity of this situation. Um, she, her office also appealed the overturning of capital punishment. She was pro-death penalty. Civil asset forfeiture has been a tool that she has used aggressively. Taking people's things without a charge against them is downright piracy, basically. And it's an abuse of a law that is vastly different from intent. And Harris was a huge part of perpetuating that problem. When uh, she discovered, when it was discovered that she defeated a bill that would have paid prisoners $1 per hour instead of 8 to 32 cents, she explained... The way that argument played out in court does not reflect my priorities. The idea that we incarcerate people to have indentured servants is one of the worst possible perceptions. I feel very strongly about that. It evokes imagery of chain gangs, despite having advocated for not increasing the wage to a dollar. She advocated behind the scenes for one thing and then said to the public when challenged another. This is a pattern, and this was uh, not that long ago. Uh, her tactics made it so that these nonviolent prisoners could be janitors for eight cents an hour, but forbid them from pursuing jobs like firefighting for $1 per hour, She, which would have given them skills that made their recidivism rate much lower while giving them some economic cushion once they left. Um, while it's a common problem for Democrats to promise too much free stuff, Harris was actually the worst offender. Uh, she was actually measured, and John Stossel has a great video that we put in the, the show notes. Um, overall, as Elizabeth Nolan Brown, who wrote this great article called Her Kamala Harris is a cop that wants to be now vice president, uh, she writes, in the public eye, she spoke of racial justice and liberal values, bolstering her cred as one of the Democratic Party's rising stars. But behind closed doors, she repeatedly fought for more aggressive prosecution, not just of violent criminals, but of people who committed misdemeanors and, quote, quality of life crimes. And uh, has she changed? She's changed on marijuana. At least we can see that. And she now gives lip service to popular ideas. 
Nick Gillespie called her one of the most, arguably one of the most libertarian on drug policy at this point, uh, and wrote an article saying that, saying so, and giving his argument why. But you know, there's just a very clear pattern when you look at her record over these 30 years of doing the least, like where libertarians and progressives overlap it is in terms of criminal justice it is in terms of ending the drug war it is in terms of n not prosecuting nonviolent criminals it is taking the boot of the state off the neck of people especially those who can't afford to fight for themselves who the, the public defender system is broken it doesn't actually defend people from a prosecutor because they're overworked they may have 70 80 90 cases that they're trying to work through, whereas a prosecutor has almost, they don't have endless resources, but they have a lot more resources than a public defender does. Uh, they, or, or even you, if you were able to hire an attorney. Uh, this is a person that, when she was in power, as Tulsi Gabbard so eloquently pointed out, that destroyed her presidential run, when she had the opportunity to do something about these issues, she chose not to do anything. In fact, she chose to suck up to the public because she thought they wanted her to be tough on crime. She didn't take the principled stance. She didn't side with progressives or libertarians on these issues. She was part of the problem. She was a draconian prosecutor. When Killer Mike is standing in Atlanta during the riots three months ago saying, beat up your local prosecutor who chooses to over-criminalize. He's talking about Kamala Harris. Prosecutors have enormous leeway in what laws they choose to enforce and how aggressively they choose to enforce it. And this is a person that when they had power, they chose to aggressively pursue certain things for political gain. And do we want that person at the level, at a higher level of power, knowing that she is going to continue to abuse those who she says she's fighting for? I don't think so. I think it's it's disqualifying her record. Even if she says she's had a change of heart, her ethics are challenged at best, and her word is suspect. Well, the problem is, too, that if you have a change of heart, that's all well and good, but if you your history shows you saying one thing and doing another, then it becomes a you-have-to-show-me type of situation. You can't just say all the right things because you've said all the right things before but your actions never never backed it up so i think that's the situation she's in now yeah where she she's saying all the right things because politically she knows what she's supposed to say but let's let's see some action let's see some some actual proof that you really believe this or you have turned over another leaf you know when nick talks about her being libertarian on drugs it's you know the history shows that's not the case now she may have had a change of heart and she's saying the right things but what is she doing to back that up is the question right yeah uh, it, so can you trust her can you trust joe biden i don't in these two episodes feel that you can trust them any more than you can trust donald trump i mean you know it, it's if you're if you're a principled person, you're going to have to compromise your principles to vote for one of the major two party candidates. It's just it's just that simple. The things that you believe have to be compromised in order to vote for Donald Trump or for Joe Biden or for their running mates. That's it just is what it is. If you if you are a Tea Party Republican from Indiana, I beat up on them yesterday. I looked at my friend Mike Neal, who worked on his campaign, and I said, Where's the bottom for you? You have told me for years you're a constitutional Christian conservative who, who believes in these things, and Mike Pence did too. But look at this man. You're debasing yourself. Well, I can I can vote for somebody without compromising my morals. Yeah, but you lessen your credibility with those not in your crowd, and your crowd is ever shrinking. If you believe in the Black Lives Matter movement, if you believe in ending the drug war, ending mandatory minimums, ending qualified immunity, ending you know the tools available to draconian prosecutors like Kamala Harris, can you trust Joe Biden? 
Because when you look at their records, you can't. You cannot trust the two of them. They, they have, when they were in power, made the wrong decisions every time. Now the, now the pushback from liberals is we can hold them more accountable if Joe Biden is in office. And I'd say, have the Republicans held Donald Trump accountable in office? Or do they do whatever a president wants because Congress has become a lackey to the president? Can you trust them? And the answer is you cannot trust any of the four of these people. Well, the other thing, too, is they'll come back and say, well, that's just Trump and his cult with the Republicans. But they prove they don't do that when Obama was in office and he wanted to uh, continue the wars and bomb people and do all the stuff that for years the left was railing against as anti-war. We need to stop this, this these wars. We need to get out of Afghanistan. We get out of Iraq. He, he, he continued all of that stuff and they all turned a blind eye. They did not hold him accountable. Like yeah. they said, they say they're going to do now. So how can you trust them when they've proven that they couldn't do that then? It's the cult of the omnipotent state. I think it was Murray Rothbard that uh, coined that. It's the, the idea that the federal government, the cult of the presidency, as Gene Healy wrote a great book on the cult of the presidency. Uh, the cult of the omnipotent state is the idea that the the federal government, the state governments, the government at all can save you, that it helps you, it benefits you. In reality, they tell you one thing and they do the other. And so until, like, what I always try to tell people is you know the truth. You feel it in your head, in your heart. You know it in your head. You just need it to reach your balls. (laughs) And so you need to start voting differently or doing what T.K. Coleman talked about in that great episode with him, innovating our way out of this and stop looking to the state altogether to save you in any way, shape or form, build a life around libertarian principles and peaceful solutions and economic opportunity for new people and grow the power of libertarianism and our ideals to the power, to the point that people look at that example and go, I'm done with this cult of thinking that these people are in my corner 